Here we go. Oh, no, 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 Harry. Okay. Hey guys, cool. welcome back to the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have two amazing guests with me today. Today we're going to be discussing the out of Australia theory. But you know, I'm sure you guys have heard about the out of Africa theory. Well, this debunks that, and this is the out of Australia theory. But it's not just that we came out of Australia; that it's that we, they have a website called Our Alien Ancestors where they talk about how we came from extraterrestrial species, specifically Pleiades. And who I'm talking about is I'm talking about Stephen and Evan Strong. The two have spent time studying with the indigenous tribes in Australia, but uh, it's about Stephen. He's a secondary school teacher with a background in archeology span and education. He's involved in the formation of the graduate diploma in Aboriginal education for the North South, North South Wales Department of Education, writing units on traditional law and contemporary history. He also co-authored a highly successful Aboriginal Australia, a language and cultural kid. And Evan Strong, his son, has a background in anthropology and indigenous cultural studies, counseling and meditation with a bachelor's degree in social science and graduate studies in psychology. Evan has worked as a researcher for the North Rivers Health Service, social worker, teacher's aide, and funeral director. And I want to thank you guys for joining me. I give you a warm welcome. Hey, uh, Steve and Evan, thank you for joining me. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us on. We appreciate it. So what do you, uh, let me ask you this. I just had someone on about the Anunnaki. Like, I know we're not really going to get into that today, but what is you, what are you guys thoughts on that? Do you think we've, that, that we've been visited by the Anunnaki and Pleiadians and all around the world? Absolutely. Um, and we've got, yeah, look, the, the trick is in Australia, I, I don't know if this is the right word for it, but it strikes us that this is a Pleiadian only zone where, yeah, all the other mob, uh, have done whatever they want in different places, but I think there's been a different agenda in Australia, and it's very clear to us. And we've even got, yeah, I've got it there. We've got dreaming stories about them coming uh, to Australia for the specific reason of actually genetically creating something and intermixing their genes with ours. So yeah, it's a different story in the rest of the world because some of the other alien groups that have been here haven't had the same benevolent intentions. There's been a mixture there. Yeah, a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. The Anunnaki have definitely visited Earth. Um, we just haven't come across anything Nothing. to suggest that they've been here in no. Australia. No. But as for Africa and the Middle East and um, other places like that. Like oh, Africa, self yourself. Thama, right? yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, in that sense, yeah, it's mainly Pleiades here. Um, there's talk of some other constellations. Um, Orion's mentioned, but it's within the story of Pleiades. Yeah. 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 Um, well, what I wanted to talk about was um, you guys talk about the out of Australia theory. Could you tell everybody a little bit about that and like how, how you guys came up with that? Because I'm in my notes here, I have that. They said the Australians were, were um, doing brain surgery and they had knowledge of penicillin in the ancient times, right? And mm, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah there's, there's archaeology. We know of two sites. One, we know of um, one instance of an amputation at Lake Mungo 23,000 years ago. And there's two instances of skulls that have been found that have perfectly cut circles through the center there. And the experts have said, yeah, that's brain, tre brain trepidation. They have cut in there and the people they cut would have survived. So, yes. Um, yeah, as for the penicillin, yeah, they they were using that. It was a, a lichen or a mould that grew, I think, on the south-facing base of certain trees. And who were the two people who invented penicillin? Because one of them was Australian, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And he actually admitted that he got that idea from the Australian original people and he looked at that bark penicillin there, and then from that, that gave him the inspiration. So, yes, there was a time in Australia going back a long, long time where things were a lot different, and the technology in Australia was far more advanced. Our understanding is the Australian original people abandoned that technology and threw basically everything away and became very much like the Indians, the naked sadhus they became spiritual people and they found that the technology they were using was not compatible with Australia. So they walked away from it. And why did you think they walked away from it? Uh, I think one reason only. Um, you look at the world today and we're competing with nature and it's not coming out well and we're not very spiritual people. We believe that during that time when Atlantis fell 
and the whole of this planet. And let's go back. We know archaeologically 12,000 years ago, the world population dropped by 95%. It was a cataclysm. And it's a bit like a nightmare. When you have a nightmare and it destroys the world, do you want to continue with that? And if you think about it, we only start, technology only starts to kick in about 5,000 years ago. There's a gap of about 7,000 years where it seemed to be nothing happened. I think there was a gap of 7,000 years where everyone that was left took a huge breath and said, we're not doing that again. We wouldn't make that mistake. It didn't work. And then as time goes by, people go, oh, I'm going to start doing this. Well, we might start doing this. We've done this quite a few times. The hobby talk about four different civilizations that came and went. And we're, we're part of that. We fully believe the hobby prophecies are great prophecies about the truth of the past. And the original people knew this failed. And we found plenty of evidence in Australia of advanced technology. It's just a bucket full of the stuff. The government knows that too, and they're not very happy with us. But that's, I think it was a conscious decision to walk away and then come back and become hunter gatherers and a sort of no, no, no till farmers. Well, yeah, to an extent, they, they did farming in a way that didn't really affect the environment they in a detrimental way. Like they yeah. did have fields of certain grasses but instead of getting machinery and tilling it and and working that soil they threw the seeds on the ground and then some come up some and did then not. they harvested that and we've got proof there of um grindstones that have got grain inside them that's eighteen thousand years old that's way before anyone else is farming but all of this was done in cooperation with nature See, certain areas they would set up uh, almost houses for several months of the year, like here in our local area, they had a long house on the beach because there's just so much seafood. And they were there, what, seven or eight months of the year? Yeah, and Captain yeah. Cook said that, that that building at Shelley Beach was 70 yards long and four yards across. So yes, we had some forms of buildings there. We had remnants of what we did before, but there seemed to be a continental agreement. That was appalling. We're not going back. And they kept that way until the British invasion, which the Americans would know about because they did one for there too. The British invasion of 1770 began then in 1788. They brought people here and started stealing the land. So that's when our lifestyle changed from that point on. And what, let me ask you this. Like, what, what happens do we have? Uh, well, wait, I will, I'll start to ask you this. What, what, why, why would you, it started changing to be more technologically at that point, do you think? Oh, no, we didn't have a choice. I mean, we wanted to keep living the same way. But when the white fellas came here, they brought their guns, they brought their farming equipment, they brought their steel, they brought all the other stuff and went back to what we walked away from. And, of course, the original people for quite some time would have nothing to do with it. But after a while... Oh, the shot killed all jailed. <laughs> they didn't have a choice anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's well, the Americans would know the same story because you guys started 200 years before us and we were the last continent on this planet where that lifestyle was stolen. And, and, and you said the Hopi. Like, I used to listen to Art Bell. I still do. But Art used to have a lot of Hopi elders on there. And they used mm. to preach about the same way that you're talking, like that we should live in a more primitive lifestyle. Is, is that what you're getting at, that we should we should be all be living in a more primitive lifestyle? Uh, what I'm getting at in particular is the Blue Kachina prophecy of the two brothers returning. And we believe that happened uh, on the 21st of December at Uluru 2020. And they have a prophecy about the change of everything. And Evan's got sections of it. We, we actually base a lot of our work on two prophecies from the hobby, but the Blue Kachina one is about the beginning of a change. I love the that. Return, the return of the Blue Star, uh, blue star Kachina, who is also known as Nen Ga Sohu, will be the alarm clock that tells us of a new way of life, a new world that is coming. This is where the changes begin. They will start as fires that burn within us and they will burn up with desires and conflict if we do remember the original teachings and return to the peaceful way of life. And that's what we're on about. What we're trying to teach people is what are the original teachers because the, the Hopi make it very clear when the two Kabuchinas come and they have and the Red Purifiers come and he's also come in the sky too. That is the final sign. Which we have pictures of. Yeah, which we actually have pictures of. We've got quite a lot of proof of what happened to Uluru two years ago. And from that point on, 
what, why we've done all those online conferences to teach people about what are the old teachings that the poppies speak of, because it's very important to understand the world is now falling apart. I mean, the Mayans talk about the two roads. Well, they're here. And what the roads are is you can keep walking down that road of technology and chaos and greed and where a few people run the world and don't care about the rest of us, or you can go down that old tribal road. And, of course, it's got to be readapted. Um, those who return to the ways given to us in the original teachings and live in a natural way of life will not be touched by the coming of the purifier. They will survive and build the new world. Only in the ancient teachings will the ability to understand that these messages will be found upon every living thing, even within our bodies, even within a drop of blood. All life forms will receive messages from the twins, those that fly, the plants, even the rabbit. Yeah. So basically, we're working on the prophecies of the indigenous people around the world. We've decided that their prophecies, because the original people would speak of the same thing and the ceremony we did, which went around the world, and there were 15 to 20 million people involved in that ceremony, that was the final chance for humans to have the right to stay on this planet. You see, the rule is this, what we've been told, we were told about this prophecy nearly 10 years ago, that every animal on this planet, bar one, lives with nature. And the, 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 the animal that doesn't, of course, is us, and therefore we have to earn the right to stay on this planet. It's not given to us. We have to... What the Hopi have said is if you do not embrace the old teachings, which respect nature, you will not stay on this planet. They've been very insistent on that. And primarily because I'm original, I've been given ceremony, old way. Evan's my son, so therefore whether he likes it or not, he is too. Our job, and has been for the last 10 years, is to let people know this change is coming and that people have to make a choice. When do you think that like the to the full changes? Who who is the blue kachina though? Is it the extraterrestrials? No, 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 no. Well, it's it is and it isn't. The extraterrestrials are heavily involved in this. What what they said was the blue kachina will reveal himself in the arcade in the sky. Now, what happened on the day of that ceremony above us at Uluru? And it was the sun had set, and we've got. Uh, would Would you like me to? Um, are we able to uh, share some pictures? I could yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me. Uh, ah. me. I have to. I think I have to. Hold on. Let me pause this. Well, I don't. I'll keep it recording. I might have to make you the host, and then. Um, and then. I think you just uh, allow permission to share screen. Let me see. Uh, Hostess disabled participant sharing. I just did switch. it. I let you share. You should be able okay. to. Uh, right. Okay. Okay, we're back. Okay. What we'll do is we'll take you and your listeners through actually what happened on that day. Now, if I can, I just want to explain something in advance that I was approached probably five, six years before and told about this ceremony that was going to take place. And there had been nine years of preliminary ceremonies working up to this day. Now, the 20th December, 21st of December in 2020 was the alignment of three planetary objects. It was a summer solstice and the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn with this planet. And that was supposed to be the beginning of the change. Now, the story was this. The elders were going to do ceremony at Uluru on that day, at that time, 7.32 and now night, and that would turn on what they called the magic box within Uluru. But the magic box could not be powered up. It's a bit like turning an engine on and it's idling. But if you wanted to drop into gear, we had to earn that right, and there had to be a certain number of people around the world that were meditating and sending their thoughts towards Uluru. Now, we knew exactly what the number was, and we exceeded it by a factor of 10 because between 15 to 20 million people around the world were meditating at that moment. It's the first time on this planet that so many people have sent good vibrations into the planet to one place, which was Uluru. So we knew that was the story. Now, what we tried to do in the seven or eight months leading in there, we started this online conference and we did seven of those to let people know, come and join us. But on every occasion, Robert, I want to make a point. There were so many people trying to stop this ceremony. On every occasion, we told people, we don't know if it's going to happen. And I think it was brilliant that 15 to 20 million people joined us on a maybe. So let us show you what actually took place because we did the ceremony. We were asked to take the rocks near Uluru, and we did. But what's interesting is for the first time ever at Uluru, 
At 10 o'clock on the morning of the 21st of December, the original people kicked everyone out of the site. Thousands of people were there and they told them all to leave. And they've never done that before. And it was closed the rest of that day and the next day. Reason being, they were doing secret sacred ceremonies in language and only the people who knew the knowledge of this were allowed to be there. So they cleared the place out. We did a ceremony. We were asked to take the sacred rocks we've got. And we did that ceremony at Yulara, which is a resort that's near there, about 15 k's away. Yeah, about that. Yeah. So what, if you can, please, Evan. Evan will now take us through the pictures there and we'll show you actually what happened. So this is what we, uh, we got this the next day from Croatia. And apparently it was shown in, I think, some of the Serbian, Bosnian, a few different news channels covered it. And uh, this is a light. Now, remember, the, the, the um, hobby said, look to the skies for the signs. So we were looking to the skies for the signs. And this is, and that happened at 7.32, our time at Uluru. So you're seeing what's happening around the world at exactly the same time. Thousands of people saw this in Croatia and it went viral on the internet. So we're going to show you little snippets of what took place. At 7.32, you will see there we've got the Schumann residence. Oh, I thought we had it. Yeah, this just shows you what... Oh, well, don't worry about that so are. much. Okay, the Schumann residence is a residence. It's a heartbeat of this planet. And at 7.32, if you could go back to that, please, Evan. There it is. At 7.32, it was running at 0.3, and at 7.32, it went up to 32, which is an increase 100-fold, and stayed like that for the next four hours. So what I'm saying there is that meditation that humans did. Now, we don't know. We can't prove that's what happened at Uluru. That's the whole planet. That shows you that the... The thoughts and the meditation of humans actually can have an, an impact on the planet because during those four hours from around the world, people were meditating and doing ceremony towards the planet and it responded. So there's the first piece of evidence that took place at that time. Uh, since that time, there's several points where the university measures this. If it's too far off the scale, it, it blocks what they call a blackout so that that happened it's been happening ever since yeah. that's why i haven't shown that that's been continual the schumann residence has been ramping itself up because ladies and gentlemen what happens is eventually the schumann residence stays in the hundreds and never drops and the thing that's now now we've got the next part of this story this is us doing ceremony at 7 32 and we had 300 people sitting around the rocks and i want you to look at the sky now, the sun has set. Now, remember we spoke about the blue kachinas. Can you see that massive black blue pa patch in the middle there? Yes. Now that, that, I've got to tell you, that same cloud, when I was setting the rocks up <clears throat> 20 minutes before, was black, and it spat rain yeah, on Yeah, we it. thought it was going to rain on We it. thought it was going to rain. Now, after sunset, is there any other pictures of the clouds here? Because there's other ones that give the different colours. Yeah. It goes from Uluru to Katachuna. And they are the male and female site, and it just covered that area. And you can see even in that one, there's that blue patch in the center. And there's a picture again. There's the, the sky before that took place, and there's the sky that happened after. We actually spoke to the security guard for um, Yalara there and said, have you ever seen the sky like that? And she said, never. So there we've got one part of the story where we've got one of the two brothers because the two brothers were to show themselves in the southern and northern hemisphere. Now, here is the northern hemisphere, Georgia, USA. At 7.32, our 7.32 there, it was the moon. And around that particular patch, you've also got the blue sky. So there's the two blood brothers that the, prop, uh, that the poppy prophesied. So you're now you're getting what I would call circumstantial evidence but we have stronger evidence coming up. Okay, now Evan's going to play this twice, but let me lead you in. This was taken at 7.37, five minutes after it started. Now, the whole world is now meditating towards Uluru. And what you're going to see, and Evan's going to play it twice, is the whole of the sky explodes. Now, I want to make a point. The people who were doing this weren't at our ceremony. There was no one behind them. If anyone thinks it's a flashlight that's somehow reflected out, have a look at Uluru because it doesn't get covered in the white and the white covers the whole sky because you can see the color of the sky. Play it, please, Evan. Okay, play it a second time. 
Can you see that explosion of white? Yes. That came out of Uluru alone. Now, that happened at 7.37 or 7.37, that's right. So now we're starting to get a little bit more there because, yes, the Schumann resonance has ramped up, but there we're seeing in one place in particular, Uluru, this magic explosion of light. And we believe that was the magic box had now turned itself on completely. The elders would have been doing their ceremony there. Now you're seeing what's happening elsewhere. Now, Evan's now going to take you around the world at the same time to see what other parts. Remember, the hobby said, look to the skies for the signs. So the next one we've got that's is in Hungary. That's in Hungary. Okay. Now, this one is in Glasgow. And that actually, this was covered in the newspapers. And you can see one of those lights is actually going past a house and running next to it. And they said it was something like the War of the Worlds. They were nearly right. It was called the Glasgow News. It was actually the war of this world. This world it was exploding in energy that was coming all over the place. This is another part of that story. Okay, the next one, please, Evan. Oh, yeah, that, that's not so important. No. When I finished putting up the rocks, I'd always look for a sign to make sure I put them in the right formation. As I did that, a male and a female cockatoo flew past and we knew that was a bird sign because bird signs are very important in sacred ceremony. Yeah, they're messengers. They're messengers. <laughs> right. Now, there is the group. We had 300 people. I was running the ceremony that were sitting in five circles around the rocks and you can see the sun is setting there. Okay. Now, remember, at the end of this, you're going to see that massive blue and notice the clouds there are still that grey colour. Now, if they're going to be red, it should be as the sun is setting, not after it's gone. That's the point that everyone noticed straight away. So moving on, please, Evan. Now, that's something interesting that I needed to talk about. And you can see there, by the way, how dark it is, but you can still see what's going on with the clouds. There are ridiculous colours there. What actually happened is after we finished, uh, see that light there? There were little lights there, and inside there was the actual um, the rocks. Now, what actually happened to the people there? Once this ceremony was complete, we had the rocks inside and no one was allowed to go inside there bar me. And I was slowly putting away. And then I looked up around me and there was about a dozen people in a circle. This is about the fifth circle you're looking at now. And they started chanting very much like an American Indian ceremony around a campfire when they're singing and chanting. No one asked them to do it. This is very important. No one said, let's do this. It happened spontaneously. And I was not only picking the rocks, I was throwing the rocks and people were racking them because I'm the only person allowed to touch them. And I'm trying to get away because these people are getting closer. And within three to four minutes, maybe 10 minutes at the most, there were 200 people inside that circle dancing. Nobody knew why they were doing it. And they did this for about half an hour, didn't they, Evan? They did. Until they were basically exhausted. This was people becoming tribal. They were actually being overtaken by what was taking place at the time. And this is another piece of evidence, but the major piece of evidence is coming up, isn't it, Evan? Now, this is a one-minute, 30-second video taken by a person who was legally blind, not where we were, somewhere else. Can you see that blue patch again we're talking about in the sky? It's amazing. Now, nah, what you're going to see now is you're going to see through. He's just hit it now, and I'll talk it through. I want you to look at this? something. No, the, the music volume yeah. down there. Yeah. You see that thing moving past there? Just watch it. You'll see it every now and then because he can't see it. He's filming the sky, but there's something moving ever so slowly. Yeah, look up like the killer -ish. Oh, and it wow. moved to this, Yeah, and now this is moving so slow. It was a plane. It would crash. And it's directly over Uluru. Which you legally aren't allowed to do. You are not allowed to fly over Uluru. It's against the law to do so. Now, he can't see it. They only found this a couple of days later. Oh, it's a couple of months, actually. A couple of months later. Photos and went, What's this? Now, I want you to watch for a sec when he drops down. What is this woman filming? Not Uluru. She's filming that. She's seen it. But he can't see it. Now, when we come back again... He's gone back to the other side of the sky to look at the different colours there because we've never seen this before. And when we come back again, we're going to pick up that object, I think. I'm not sure. It'll... Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's flying in towards it. And it's making its way towards that blue patch. Now, here's the trick, ladies and gentlemen. Now, people have said, there's a picture of what we actually saw there, right? Now, what's really fascinating is that the 59th and 60th second, there's no UFO there. But somebody was very clever, and they slowed down the film, and there's four frames, frames per second. And on the 59th second, on the fourth frame, that object reappears. Then the next three frames, it disappears, and on the 60th second, on the fourth frame, it reappears again. There is no object we could make. There's the two there, one minute and 59 seconds, and it's actually pointed out in different spots there. But in the other six frames, you can't see it. Now, what we also did, I don't know if that comes up next, Evan, if we got the air. What we decided to do is we knew what the cynics would say. Well, Some of us told it was a drug runner that was flying through the air. And of course, all of that, all of the Aboriginal communities were in lockdown. But what we also found out was we got, there it is, there's the flight path map at 7.32. And there is only one fl flight in the whole of Northern Territory, 400 k's to the west. And we were looking east. And it's a Jetstar flight going from Darwin to Adelaide. So it wasn't a plane. Now, the second thing people said was it could have been a helicopter. But the people who took this film were in the last helicopter that flew out of Uluru from 4 to 5 o'clock, and after that, all the helicopters were locked down. So what you're looking at cannot be a plane. It cannot be a helicopter. What is it? And the point is, if it was a plane or a helicopter, we've got 300 people sitting in the middle of the we desert would, we meditating. We're meditating quietly. No one's singing. No one's dancing. We are 20 minutes of absolute silence. And someone's telling us there's a helicopter flying above and we can't hear it. Rubbish. A plane flying above? There wasn't a plane. There wasn't a helicopter. That was a UFO. And it was flying towards that blue patch. And when it got to the blue patch, it was there for one frame and gone for three. There for one frame, gone for three, then gone. That was a UFO. Now, the beauty of this is, and I love it, because people were saying, I'm sure the UFOs are going to come. I said, I hope not, because I don't want people with big, big UFOs saying, oh, my God, I want to be good now. That's not how it's got to be. There's got to be an element of doubt in this. Mm -hmm. So that's what took place. We've got the Schumann residence increasing 100-fold at 7.32. We've got an explosion of light coming out of Uluru at 7.36. And while that's going on, we've got this object moving at about 15 k's an hour. I don't know of anything we've got that can do that. Moving across there and then disappearing in the middle of nowhere. And the clouds have gone bizarre. We've got a blue patch there. We've got a blue patch of Georgia. That is the Hoppy prophecy being fulfilled. And, of course, wow. they did talk about the red purifier, a red eye in the sky that would signal the final sign that it was coming. And that was taken in Spain about 16 days, about 20 days after that took place, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Not far behind the twins will become the purifier, the red kachina who will bring the day of purification. On this day, the earth for creatures and all life as we know it will change forever. Right. So notice it said not far behind. Well, it was about 20 days behind. That's what turned up. Now, don't tell me what that is. This is a natural cloud, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm sorry you've lost me. And you should turn this show off because you're not with us anymore. So what we're showing you now is part of, and by the way, I want to make the point that what was turned on at Uluru, what was inside Uluru were Pleiadian crystals that were put there to purify this planet. This is a long-term plan that takes place. Another blackout that's still continuing. Oh, that's continuing all the time. Don't worry about the blackouts, okay? They're constant. That's going to continue happening. Now, our understanding is that what happens is all things happen in three. Oh, by the way, there's one more thing we want to show you. Our elders told us, the original elders told us one other thing. They said, look to the birds. And when they start behaving badly in ways that you can never understand, that is the final sign that came from Arnie Minnie Mace. So I want to show you this one now from Walmart in America. 
Yo, what the fuck is this? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like that, uh, that bird box shit, that movie. They're no, they're landing in my car. Ah, I need to clean this is so weird. Now, what, what, these, these signs are being taking place, and that comes from Russia again. The sky's there. Oh, my God. I don't understand Russian, but I reckon they're swearing. This is so amazing, this phenomenon. I've never seen any of this. I didn't even know this was happening. Well, we've Thank got you. a lot more. We actually, I told Evan, take it out because we've got so much of the stuff. We'd end up filling up the whole show with that alone. I don't want to do that on self because I, I want to really talk about why this is all happening at the end. Now, what we're saying, all we're doing is we're listening to what the hobby and what our elders have told us. Our elders said, look to the birds. And we've got lots of pictures of birds doing the craziest things. We just put up one. The the iceberg. There's ones where they all just slam into the pavement. Thousands of birds slam into the pavement. They just come from nowhere like a, a, a massive avalanche of birds and they slam into the pavement. Hundreds died. And the experts said this, oh, a hawk did it. I thought, oh, right, thanks for that, guys. So we've got all sorts of explanations for what you're seeing, but we could probably, we've probably kicked out 20 or 30 more of these pictures that have come in because now that people know what we're doing, they send it to us from all over the world. Now, it doesn't get on mainstream TV. I know that would be a shock to you, Robert. It never will because yeah. there's no explanation for it. But what we're showing you is what I think is very important here. People talk about, I know the Americans now, the Pentagon and the U.S. Committee, uh, Parliamentary Committee, are trying to debate whether UFOs exist. I think that's a pointless exercise, and to an extent, it, it pushes you away from a more important question, not if they exist. Which they do. Which they do. The important story is why they are here, not if they are here. That's done and dusted. We're not interested in that. This is about what we're trying to show people is why they came, why they've invested so much time and effort. Why did the Pleiadians, the Arcanatums, in fact, every group have come here? We're interested in that part of the story, the why. That, to me, is the most impart, important part of this. And what is so, the why? What is the, the that's why? the point. Okay. For that, two things. Number one, I've got to explain that the third part of our group, we've got three in our group, Evan and myself, we're going to show you now. Evan's going to show you. Here they are. All right. I've just got to get, um, yeah, I'll see. Okay. I'm sharing the screen again because I've had to go to the, okay. back to the slideshow. Okay. Now, this is some archaeology I did. And I stumbled upon, I've seen four of these beings in Australia. Now, the first thing I want you to notice with these beings is I want you to, the people are listening, I want you to check and feel if you've got a forehead. And you're all going to tell me you've got one. I want you to look at this one and ask the same question. Has this being got a forehead? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Are your eyes as big as those ones? Absolutely not. Does your nose look like that? Can you see how the nose is beginning above the eyes? It's sticking out a bit of the nose there. The answer is no. I don't look a thing like that. Now, I want to very quickly take you through what these one of these beings looks like that have been living with us. This was buried. Okay, next one, please, Evan. Right. I want you to look at the skull. It runs backwards like a flask. And our skull is around about 12 centimetres across at the widest point in the middle. This one here at the back is 18 centimetres across. Now, I want you to think about something for a second, Robert. I know you're not a lady. But when women give birth, they've got to dilate to 10 centimetres, right? So the baby, that head can get through because the rest of the body can. Could they dilate to 18 centimetres? The answer is it's impossible. They can't do it. And I've done talks, and every time I've asked the ladies there, hand up the people who want to give a natural birth to this particular being. No, put there, And then I say, who wants to do caesarean? And every hand goes up. It's impossible for anything like that to be human. I've taken that to the top archaeologist in Australia, haven't I, Evan? Yes. He just said, I don't know what it is, but it's not a sapien. It's not a hominid. I don't know what it is. And two days later, the government got to him and stopped him doing any more work on it. Yeah, because we were saying, oh, could you carbon-14 date it? And he's like, no, why would I do that? It's way too old. Way too old. Anyway, show a few more pictures of that one, please, Evan. 
And the most interesting part of this beam that I'm showing you now, which I was the one who did the archaeology on, is not the femur bone which you're looking at there, but the humerus bone. Now, the humerus bone, your humerus bone, Robert, might be 29 to 30 centimetres. The big basketballers might be 31. A gibbon is 35. The humerus bone I picked up measured 43, but there was no elbow joint. So it has to be at least 46 or longer. Wow. Now, here's the interesting part. It was really thin. So what have we got with this being I'm showing you now? This is to prove to you this part about if is done. We're not doing things flying in the sky. We're doing things buried in the ground. The eyes are 46% bigger than ours. The humerus bone is going to be at least, at least about 100% larger than one that we've got. And the interesting part is the humerus bone is so thin, it wouldn't work. So I've got eyes that you can't take out during the daytime because it'd be too bright. And I've got an arm that is so thin, it wouldn't function. Now, if I halve the gravity and halve the light, it would work. But you know what? That means I've got to leave this planet. It is no way that being, and by the way, we found four of them, four. And that one you're looking at there had two front teeth taken out, which is the same initiation ceremony that tribe did until Cook came. So it was buried there with a lot, a lot of respect. And it's not us. They were living with the original people. Whether they're Pleiadians or a group that comes before, I cannot answer you. But I've got quite a few of them. And in a second, when we come back and get off the slides, I'll show you another one we've got here. We've actually got these beings with us. Wow. So they are. And there's another picture. And notice that, that nose that's sticking out. That Our nose looks nothing like that. Our eyes look nothing like that. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think about one thing while we're saying this. A very important point is if you were to take that being there and mix it with us, what would you get? And here's what I want you to think about. If you looked at an orangutan, they all look the same, don't they, roughly? You looked at chimpanzee, which is supposed to be our closest relative that we're supposed to have had as our mummy and daddy. Oh. What will happen there is very simply, they all look roughly the same. In fact, if you look at a zebra, if you look at any animal on this planet, they basically have the same height, the same weight, the same face. And then you look at humans, seven billion of them. And who's got the same face? None of us. How tall are we? Half a metre to two metres, two and a half metres. How much do we weigh? 40 kilos to 400 kilos. How fast can we move? Half a K to 35 Ks. What do we actually, oh, what do our fingerprints look like? They're all different. What do our retina patterns look like? They're all different. What do we actually have in common with each other? Nothing. Every other animal on this planet is basically the same, unless we play with their genes, and then it changes a bit, doesn't it? So what happened to us? We're told by the experts that there was a monkey daddy and a monkey mummy, and they made us. You know what's wrong with that? All hominids have sutures. And did you know that all apes, primates, don't have sutures? So this monkey daddy and this monkey mummy that don't have sutures made Denisovans, Neanderthals, us, and we all had sutures, and they didn't have them. Doesn't make sense. And if it was the monkey daddy and the monkey mummy, we should all look the same, but we don't. Then it comes back to one thing. We're mixed with someone else. And I wanted to show you that first to show you who that was. Now we get to the last part of this story as to why. Now, in that respect, we're lucky because the third part of our group, Leah, has been uh, telepathically and physically taken by aliens since the age of six. And, of course, people are going to say, hey, I've heard that before. But what we did, and this book is only two days out. It's only just got out. We've been doing online conferences quite some time, and I've been asking uh, this alien who's called Mesreth, and he's one of the alien groups that lives forever and feeds on light and has been confused with being angels, where that story comes from. We've been interviewing him and asking him all sorts of questions about why we're here, how did we get here, and why are you guys here? And it's called Interview with an Alien, and primarily what I've said in the back cover is, now, if I said to someone, you could talk directly to God, would you? And I said, only a fool would say no. 
But what if I could give you the next in line? And that's who this person is. And we've asked him these questions about why are you here? And this, the answer is very simply this. This is a huge galactic experiment. And what they're trying to do, and this planet that we live on is possibly the most magical planet in the cosmos. Now, the story is this, that this experiment was placed here where all different types, they brought humans here. And what they did then was they gave us their genes and our genes, and we've got all sorts of genes. In fact, I think the scientists tell us that 90% of our genes don't work. They just spectate. And I think to myself, if 90% of my heart didn't work, what would I be? Dead. 90% of my liver, I would be dead. But they're telling us our genes don't work. They do, but they're going to be turned on. That's what I'm leading up to, ladies and gentlemen. They will be turned on. Because when this planet ascends, all of the genes that have been dumbed down and ignored will come back to life. Now, the problem is many people on this planet, if that happens, that will overwhelm them and kill them. And that is why there's going to be a division that takes place before that happens. So this is all about the final stages of an experiment that's taken millions upon millions of years to come to fruition. And the, the story was this, that if that Uluru wasn't turned on by us, the whole of this planet, all the humans would be wiped out. We failed. We would fail. Because this planet, what's going to take place is when this planet turns itself on, it's like take, throwing a rock into a puddle. The ripple will go through the cosmos. This is for everybody, not just us. This is an experiment, and that's why they've spent so much time and effort and expense and lives after life to come here. Many have incarnated inside our body sometimes, and as Mesret told us, when they do incarnate in our body, they forget everything. Apparently, of all the planets in all of the cosmos, this is the most difficult one to live on because the curtain is complete. When you come here, you know nothing you forget everything from the past and you come here and most people say, I've heard these sayings, what you see is what you get and you only live once. Most people believe that. This is a beautiful planet for really being tested. And what it's done now is that experiment was the first and three years past that, which is the end of this year, will be the last. When the, at Uluru, guess what? There's an alignment of three planetary objects again on the 21st. The sun, the solstice, full eclipse of the moon, and alignment with Uranus, which is the planet of sudden change. That's what this is leading up to. So all of our online conferences we've done and the ones we're leading up to, we stop it in December. Because after that, we've been trying to do what the Hoppy said, to teach the old teachings. I mean, our next conference, we've got Arnie Trudy, haven't we? Yep. Who is an original elder, and she's going to be talking about women's business, and we're going to do men's business. And we're leading up to that now. Our last few conferences were all going to be about what the Hoppy said, the old teachings. The old teachings of the Hoppy and the old teachings of the Cherokee, Cherokee the Inuit, the Druids, and the original people are primarily all the same. There were two lifestyles on this planet, the technological lifestyle and the tribal lifestyle. Well, one's been wiped out for a period of time, but it's coming back. The Hoppy are correct. So what we're showing people today is our future. And our future begins on the 21st of December, 2022, at the time of the solstice. I don't know exactly what time that will be, but that, by the way, is the last minute the last second for people to make a decision. So that's a really oh, quick that's heavy. summation. <laughs> it is heavy, but that's basically what we've been doing recently because that's where we've been taken to. And all the stuff we've done recently fits into that story. It's an amazing story because we can't give anyone absolute empirical proof that this is going to happen. We can't do that. We don't have that skill. But what we do know is that we are a combination of the genes of 
terrestrial beings and extraterrestrial beings together. We're a mixture of all those things. Now, I can prove that because I just showed all your listeners and viewers there the one half of that equation. The mob that we say may be here, but we're not sure. Give me a break. They are here. They are here. And by the way, the Australian government knows those skulls are there, fully knows they're there. And I have a file about this thick of official letters threatening to put me into jail. And a bit massive fine. Three years jail, isn't it? And $1 million fine, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. I've been getting them. I've been getting official letters I've got to respond to now for years since we started doing this. And they've threatened. And what they've said to us is, uh, we've got skulls. We've actually, in fact, I'm going to hold one up now. This is an original skull. This is the actual bones. That's the front. And there's the back. If you can see that. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you. Here is a reconstruction made by the guy that did the reconstruction for the Australian Museum. That's what the skull looks like from the side on. Now, have a look at your own skull, and you can see that's the eyebrow ridge, and what happens past that? Now, I've got to tell you one thing. We're, 50, we're 1300 CC. This thing, and here's a reconstructed one. I'll show it to you now. Look at that. That's 1800 CC. That's much bigger and that's what it looks like now what i'm going to do now is i'm going to hold next to it us and you can compare the two wow look at the shape of the nose look at the size of the eyes and look at the far we've got look at the far they've got now you can't tell me and i know because i spoke to the top, top archaeologist in australia you can't tell me that's a human because it's not so yeah done and dusted don't look up in the sky for um, a saucer. These are in the ground. Now, we know of four of these skulls have been found in Australia. And they are spread over four tribal areas. It's not a mutation. One is on the coast. One is in the desert. And two are near a river. They're in completely different areas. And they're in three different states in Australia. So it is not because one person said we got the first one. Oh, it's a mutation. I thought, oh, yeah, a mutation that makes your skull 400 cc bigger. I wouldn't mind one of those myself, to be honest, if that's what's on offer. So it isn't that. We're now looking at who has been here, and they've lived with us. They live with us in Atlantis. They live with us in Lemuria. And by the way, Australia is part of Lemuria. And they stayed here. Do you know why they stayed? Because we did not go down that rule, uh, that path of technology and chaos. And where are we today? We're going down a road, and I want to think about that road. What does that road offer us? Disease, warfare, inequality, greed, pollution, terror, and fear. That's the road they're creating for us. And if you want to walk down that road, fine, take it. But the Mayans made it clear. The two roads will come. In fact, in another prophecy by the Hopi, it talks about the fact that, where's that other one, Evan? Can you read the first part of that? Because we do love the Hopi, because the Hopi, every Indigenous person has that. All right. So I'll read the first bit. We've been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. There are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in the right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. There is river flying now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they were torn apart, torn apart and will suffer greatly. Now the river has its destination. The elder saying we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All we do now must be done in sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And I think that prophecy, the last line, is the most important one. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And they say in the start, don't look for a leader. You jump into that river yourself. Make that leap. Now, I don't know where the river's going. <laughs> From my point of view, Robert, I can't swim. 
So for me, when I jump in that river, I've got a problem. <laughs> I've just got to grab onto someone else because I don't know how to swim. But the hobby, you, you've got to understand we've got two ways of doing this. We can listen to our leaders of today. If you want, you can follow Boris Johnson. Oh, they kicked him out, didn't they? They put someone else in. But now you can follow, we had Scott Morrison, or you could follow Joe Biden. If you want to follow those people, if you feel like they're the people who, where your destiny and future lays, then follow them. I'm not going to criticise you for it. I might scratch my head and ask why, but that's not the point. But here's the difference. We can't offer you a leader. This road that the hobby speak about, there is no leader. You have to do this yourself. It's all about you, yourself, and whether you believe that the road you're on right now is a great road. I think it's a load of trash. I think it's the worst road we've ever had here. It is appalling. Now, all the Indigenous people around the world, not just the original people, and by the way, I can tell you the hobby, the Inuit and the Cherokee and many others have said it will begin in Australia. That's very clear. You'll find the Indigenous people around the world said this ceremony begins in Australia. And what I can tell you happened is when you saw Uluru explode at 7.37, what then happened, it went to five sacred sites in Australia and one in New Zealand. Then it opened up every ley line and every sacred place on this planet. And they are now ascending. All those places now are vibrating. That's why you're seeing the Schumann rhythms kick up. When it comes to the end of this year, they will be pulsating. And I would suggest to people at that time, go to a sacred site. And by the way, a sacred site could be a creek. It could be a beach. It could be anywhere where there's not concrete, where there aren't cars and there aren't roads. Anywhere where there is nature is still sacred. Because I can tell you, from what I understand, from what my elders have been telling us, we were doing talks five, six years ago telling people in the last year of the change, there'll be pandemics, there'll be threats of world war, and of course we're getting this every day, who are we going to make war with, and that's a big one now. All of these things are done by the people who are running the show to keep us fearful. Because if you are fearful, you are not part of the change. Mm -hmm. This is such an important point I've got to make to people. I would say to those people who are getting involved in saying how bad it is, don't do it. Because you, even if you say it's bad, it's affecting you. And you're getting angry. This is not the feelings. This is not old way teaching. Old way teaching is getting back to nature. If you want to get back to nature, find a bloody tree. And I know this sounds like the hippies. Go and hug it. <laughs> we're taking people on a ceremony next week and we're demanding they hug a sacred tree before they do the ceremony. We're doing that because... This is part of the old way that the hobby speak of. In America, if you want to follow anyone, don't follow us. Follow what the hobby said. They said the hour is here. Fix yourself up. Get yourself ready and find the old ways. That's what's coming. That's what this is all about. That's amazing. That's well. I, I, I'm so glad that we did this. I was prepared for a different kind of conversation, but um, you got me motivated that this whole world's going to change now, and I'm so happy for it. I, I really, I'd really love to see this. But see, this is what this is about. That, like, uh, like what I'm also saying is, we put out that book for Mesrith. Okay. Now, what happened was, what I would do is I'd make up 10 to 12 questions every one of the ones, every one of the conferences we've done over the last 15. And we've taken the first 12 of these and we put in my answers and Leah's responses to what we said. And I've got to tell you, if you read what he said, I swear to you, you've only got to read it and you'll believe it's true because the wisdom of Mesret is way beyond anybody on this planet. Einstein looks like a kindergarten child standing next to Mesret. You don't have to believe. People are going to say, I don't believe in this. Read what was said. I would ask the most difficult questions. And I've got to tell you, I was petrified every time I do this because I didn't know the answers until Leah read them out to me. And on many occasions, I couldn't say anything. There was nothing to be said because if I said something, it would have lessened the effect of what was being said because it's outside my pay scale. This guy was has been called an archangel and a fallen angel too, by the way. Because he's all about the same thing, that each person has to find their own destiny. And that's exactly what the hobby said. We are the ones we've been waiting for. People should keep repeating that time after time after time. If you're following a leader, you're not coming. 
You're not coming this time. You can't follow a leader. It's okay if you're Christian, if you're Buddhist, if you're Hindu. It doesn't matter. That's cool. That's not the issue here. I don't care about that. That means nothing. I mean, I've got my own elders that I've listened to very carefully for guidance. But the final decision I make in certain things is always up to me. I would never go to a book if I want to make a decision. I would take account of what they've got to say and then decide what I'm going to do. Now, what Mesres have told us is, and if people don't know, I would say to you, if you were to get that book, which has only been out for two days, this is the first time we've mentioned it anyway, I think I printed about two days ago, and you read that, you would know what old teachings are. You'd learn it. And if you followed everything that Mesrev said and said, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, you would then be part of this future. That's what this comes down to. And our out of Australia theory, which we were pushing for quite some time, and we got plenty of proof that's true, because it started in Australia, and the Artemata, the great philosophers of Australia, the tribe here, they, they aren't as eloquent as the Hopi, are they? Mm -hmm. The Hopi make great stories out of they this. They just make one statement. <laughs> the Artemata said it like this. It began here, it will end here, and it will begin again here. The Hopi will make it much more eloquent than that. But what I've got to say, ladies and gentlemen, is remember, the oldest culture on this planet are the Australian Aboriginal people. It's agreed by all the experts. We were doing it before anyone else. The numbers are wrong. We've been doing it for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and so have others. But then their cultures have been falling apart. Ours never did. We kept this knowledge all the way through. And that's why the ceremony started at Uluru, because Uluru is the spiritual navel of this planet. But after the 21st of December this year, this planet will be one of the most sacred places in the cosmos. And you don't have the right to stay here unless you prepare yourself by learning what the Hopi said, the old teachings. If you don't try and learn them, you're not welcome to stay. Now, I want to make one final point, and it's this. I'm not saying, and I'm going to tell you, the majority of people on this planet will not be staying. But I'm not saying that's hell. I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying for one second, oh, you're going to hell because you didn't make it. It's not like that. I want to make the point, and I hope Mr. Gates and Suros don't get upset about what I'm going to say. But let's say that 15% of humanity have earned the right of admission to stay. What happens to the person who was next in line? There's 15.0001% and missed out by this much. Do they get punished like Soros and Gates and the Rothschilds? No, they do not. They are one word and one deed of staying here. What will happen to those people, their souls, when they leave this planet? They'll go to a planet that's reverberating at the level that this planet used to. And there they will learn their final lesson and then they can come back. But for others, and I'm thinking of the names I just mentioned, they will probably need a couple of thousand lifetimes before they might get the right to come back, and I doubt sincerely that they will. And that's their, that's their decision, not mine. Because in the long run, ladies and gentlemen, the judge, jury, and executioner in this arrangement is not Peter. It's yourself. Your soul will make that decision about whether you come or go. And you can, your intellect won't do it. You have to. And it's very simple. The Hopi said it and we'll repeat it. You have to embrace, learn the old teachings, but there's one more thing. You have to become the old teachings too. It's not enough to know them. You've also got to become that too. You can't know the solution. You have to be part of the solution. That's the deal. So very simply, and it was very quick, that's a rundown of what we think is taking place over this year. And I want to make one final point. Don't worry, the last six months leading up to this, or five months, no, it's not even that, is it? It's about three, four, mm -hmm. will be terrible. And remember this, I want to make this point, that people don't know this. You know that UFO you saw flying over the top of Uluru, and you know that light that went on. Did you know six hours after, six hours after in America, the Pentagon announced they were going to do an investigation into UFOs? Wow. Six hours after. Now, if that light hadn't have gone on and the lights didn't take place, they would have never made that announcement. They knew 
they knew this ceremony was taking place. Don't worry, at the highest level. And they've done everything they could. So many times leading up to this, we thought this was going to fail because we knew how much they were trying to stay, stop it. We even knew on the day of the ceremony, the Australian government and Qantas colluded together, and I won't even tell you that story today, to try and stop the ceremony. And um, we've got absolute proof that took place. They were trying at the very last moment in Australia to stop that ceremony happening. They did everything they could. And that's why the elders had to kick everyone off Uluru. Never been done before, never been done since, because it's a big tourist attraction in Australia and thousands go to see it every day. And everyone was kicked off at 10 o'clock, weren't they? they were. And they weren't allowed back for two days. And when they got back, the ceremony was done, the elders were gone, and it's three years to go. And now we're down to about three months. Wow. Wow, this is amazing stuff. <laughs> um, well, do you want to tell everybody where they can find your website and where they can find the book and stuff? Um, so you go to, um, for the conferences and the books, go to ouralienancestry.net. Uh, it'll have our next conferences and workshops and everything that pops up will be there. If you want to read the articles um, that we've put out and all the previous research on everything from the skulls to artifacts to you name it, um, that's in ForgottenOrigin.com. Yeah, we've got two sites, one for the alien stuff and then our website where we cover everything. Of course, the alien stuff's in there too, but we've had to separate the two because they're two stories that run together, but we've got to give honour to both of them separately. That's how we've done that. Yeah. That's cool. So, yeah. Thank you. But thank you, mate. We appreciate the chance to share that with you and share it with the people that you're in contact with. Oh, this and is amazing. amazing. I, I can't wait to put this out. I'm, I'm so happy. I, I want to see the response. I hope I hope this changes lives. I really do. And and thank you so much. I, I, I really pleasure, th Thank you. All right. Have a good night. All okay. right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, mate.